My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Embers to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. I've found that it isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today, I'm speaking with Danny DeNovo. She's a happiness coach and international best-selling author. After having battled depression and anxiety for most of her early life, Danny set out on a course to learn what true happiness was for her and for the sake of her baby girl. Now, Danny appears on ABC, Fox, NBC, and CBS TV news and talk shows as an expert on creating happiness combating loneliness and depression, and managing anxiety. Um, for, for more information about Danny, I'm going to have a link to her website in the show notes. Um, but man, this is going to be a great conversation. We're going to talk a little bit about her book and, and everything that she's doing right now to help, well, to help everybody out there. So Danny, Thank you so much for coming on and, and agreeing to have this conversation with me. I've been looking forward to this for, well, ever since we got it on the calendar. So thank you so much. Yeah, Dave, it's good to be with you. Um, well, let's, let's start off in the beginning with, you know, where you were born and raised and, and what your early life was like growing up, because, um, you know, I was, I had the privilege of hearing you speak and, and hearing your story. And that was when I, I was like, man, I, I've got to have her on the show. Um, you, you shared a lot of really amazing information and just, uh, I, I was like, that is, that is perfect. Like, I wish I had had these tools like, you know, 10 years ago, but that being said, you wrote a book and, and, you start off with, you know, your early life, your, your struggles with depression and anxiety. So can you talk a little bit about that and maybe where you think that comes from and all that? Yeah, well, I can certainly do my best. I grew <laughs> up uh, in Southwestern Pennsylvania, not far from Pittsburgh. And my early childhood, I actually remember being a lot of fun. My father had horses. And so I grew up with my own pony licorice. She was a little black Shetland pony. And I used to, you know, jump on her and get my crop and my, and my cowgirl boots. And I just used to tear it up all over the neighborhood. So I had a great time. I was always dirty. I was always helping with the horses. We had all kinds of animals around. I thought life was great. And probably around the age of 12, I really started to kind of feel a shift in things. And I kind of attributed it to growing up and, you know, you're going into your teenage years and school was changing and things just felt different. Uh, but as time kind of ticked on, I started really feeling not a lot like myself. And so I remember going to my parents and saying, I think I'm sick. I think I'm sick. I think there's something wrong. I need to go to the doctor. I just, I feel tired all the time and I'm not into stuff the way I used to be. I'm not really excited about stuff the way I used to be. I just feel worn out and kind of grumpy all the time. And I really don't have a reason to be grumpy. And my parents didn't really take me seriously. And so things started to get worse pretty quickly. Eventually, I was finally able to persuade them to take me to the doctor. And of course, they ran all these tests and did all this blood work and all this work up and not, nobody could find anything because they couldn't find anything physically wrong with me. Finally, there was one doctor who said, you know, I think you should maybe talk to somebody. Why don't you um, talk to this woman in my office? She comes in once a week and sit down, and have a conversation with her. Maybe she can find some stuff with her. And she had been a psychologist. So I went into her office one day, I was probably about 16 at the time, and we just had a conversation. She let me talk 
for about 15 minutes. And, you know, I looked at her, not really expecting an answer because no one else had an answer for me. Thought I was just kind of stuck. And uh, she looked at me and she said, honey, you're depressed. And I remember looking back at her, I mean, 16 years old, what did I know? I was like, I, I'm, I'm not depressed. I don't even know what that word means, but I'm not depressed. I have, you don't understand. I get straight A's. I have a horse. I have friends, you know, I live in a nice neighborhood. I've never seen violence or poverty. You know, even at that age, I realized I had a pretty good life. And I said, so there's, there's, you understand there's no reason for me to be depressed. And she just kind of nodded and she looked back at me and she said, honey, you're depressed. And I said, okay, well, what do we do about it? Cause I don't want to be depressed. <laughs> and she picked up the phone and she called the doctor. And the next thing I know I was on these medic, this medication, taking these pills three times a day. Um, I did not adjust well to that medication. I really didn't. I, I dealt with the side effects horribly. My pupils are always dilated. I was always sick and, um, and felt worse quite honestly. And I really just think that, uh, my body chemistry wise wasn't built for it. And so we tried one medication after another, after another, I finally went off to college. And by the time I went back for my second year of college, I had tanked. And, um, I had to drop out of school and I ended up checking myself into a mental institution. From that point in your life until now, cause now you're helping people learn how to be happy, how to create happiness in their life. And there, there's not just like a, uh, particular one incident that took you from there to here yeah it was it was pretty I would imagine it was pretty gradual and I would imagine that there's well actually, <laughs> lots of between. yeah well <laughs> yeah, I, there I, was <laughs> well I, I know just from hearing you speak that you've been able to put together a set of tools to help people and but there was therapies along the way that, I mean, gosh, had to have been horrible. Yeah. Yeah. It was bad. I mean, you know, you can even just look at talk therapy, right? Because there are a lot of really great doctors out there in the world. And I'm fortunate to have met a lot of them, but there are some really bad doctors out there too. And the same thing is true for therapists. There are some really great therapists out there and there are some ones that will really make it a lot worse for you too. And I think I had maybe middle of the road to not so great at times as far as the therapy was concerned, uh, because I really do believe as a young person that that could have been really effective uh, without having to immediately turn to the drugs. But that's what happened, right? So I went into the mental institution for the first time and I was committed for two weeks. And I remember, you know, I dropped out of school. So I you know, my whole life, I wanted to be a doctor and I thought I was going to do all this great stuff. And I was going to, um, I had already had to suck up the fact that, you know, my depression in my high school years had kind of cost me where I wanted to go to school and all of that stuff. And now I was basically, you know, I was convinced that there was no way I could ever become a doctor now that I dropped out. So, you know, I'm sitting in this room and, and there's like, there's a community room and there's all these women there on this floor with me in this lockdown unit. And, you know, they've lost, some of them have lost their children and, and some of them have gone through divorce and just these horrible stories of their life that they're talking about. And I have nothing tangible to point to other than this started when I was 12 or 13. I don't know what happened. I just know it got worse and I don't want to live anymore. And so I, I had a lot of shame around that. I had shame about my depression because I didn't even think my depression was depression worthy enough to be there. Um, so I, I went through the course of the two weeks and of course I got prescribed more medication and I just, I mean, I was totally numbed out, you, you know, I, and I'll tell you a story about that later, but, um, I, you know, I went home and, uh, I obviously couldn't get back into school for that semester. So I figured I would just try to hang through the holidays as best I could for the sake of my family. And I made it through Christmas and then I just tanked again. And I was doing a lot of really horrible things, a lot of reckless behavior because I just, I didn't want to wake up. I wanted to go to sleep and I didn't want to wake up the next morning. 
And I knew that uh, if I didn't get help again, that that was going to be the end of it. And I think there's probably a part of me that, that didn't quite want to give up. So I went back in and I'm sitting there, I'm laying in the bed, I'm looking through the bars on my window up at the moon, I'm crying, you know, saying to myself, is this it? Like, this is, this is my life. I, I had so much potential. What happened? Now I just lay in this bed in the psych unit. I'm the crazy girl at 19 years old. And the next morning, you know, the doctors came in and said, you know, we did everything we could do for you the last time. And I said, well, look, I, you got to give me something here because I'm not going to keep coming back here. And if I, and if I am not here, I'm going to kill myself. So, you know, what's the deal? And they said, the only thing we have left for you is electroshock therapy. And, uh, I didn't feel like I had any other choice. I mean, I was 19. I was a majority age, perfectly capable and legally uh, able to sign the documentation to do the treatment. And no one else was giving me anything else. My parents weren't really anywhere around to advocate for me. So I signed on the dotted line. And the next thing I know, they're wheeling me into the secret part of the mental institution. And I got downstairs and a woman with kind eyes handed me a medicine cup and said, here, take these with no water. And I just remember being like, what now, now there's just these magical pills that are showing up. And she's like, no, no, it's Tylenol. Trust me. I'd be glad you took it later. And she had me climb up on this gurney and she and another guy strapped down my arms and my legs and my torso. And they wheeled me through these huge metal doors into this room that looked like something out of Frankenstein's laboratory. And uh, I started shaking and I, I was crying. I just remember saying, oh, my God, this is a mistake. This looks this looks horrifying. And um, and then I started to get sleepy and I started to panic because I knew I was going under. And I, I was like, no, I changed my mind. Somebody hold my hand, please. I don't want to do this. And I just remember my head going, being pushed back against the pillow and strapped down. And as my head hit the pillow from behind me, I saw this really tall man coming towards me with these two metal probes in his hand. And then it went, it went black. And I remember waking up in this really dark, cold room all by myself um, with no furniture in it. And, and just being grateful that I had taken that Tylenol because I had a headache that would kill a horse and, um, and just, just being totally I'm just feeling like I'd been knocked off planet earth, right? Nothing was ever going to be the same again. And, uh, my brains had totally been scrambled. So I went, uh, through those therapies while I was still committed in the psych ward. And then when I got out of the psych ward, I had to come back in the morning to do treatments as an outpatient. And that kept going on for weeks. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, I, and I remember being at dinner one night with my brother. I had my brother's a few years younger than me. And he was telling the story about a time he and I had gone off and done something on our horses. And he's like, yeah, I remember we did this. And then we went here, we crossed the Creek and then this happened. And, and, I, and I'm like, I'm not remembering any of this. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he, he's like, yeah, you, he's like, Danny, there's no way you don't remember this. It was blah, 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 blah. Like, he's like super excited and like so much detail. Right. And, and I'm just like, I'm drawing a blank and I'm starting to panic because I can't even draw like a parallel to anything he's talking about. And it finally occurs to me that it, the memory is gone. Like my, and I started to notice that my childhood memories were completely erased and, and I saw the fear in his face. And so I started to fake it and say, oh yeah, yeah, I remember because I didn't want him to freak out, but I, I just, I lost my entire childhood almost, um, that was probably the hardest part of all of it. I was really upset about that. And, uh, and obviously it started taking a toll on me physically. There was a lot to it. I was going under anesthesia every other day and, uh, still on all this medication. And finally I just went in one day and I was like, yeah, you know what? I feel good. I think I'm going to go back to school. I don't need you guys anymore. Like it's all great. And I pretended to be, uh, doing better and did all the steps that I needed to do for the treatment to stop and for their, you know, their close observation of me to stop because I just, I couldn't take it anymore. And, um, and this is part of the story that I don't always tell, but I, I was so out of it that one day I was crossing the street and I wasn't paying attention and I stepped right in front of a bus and it picked me up and threw me about, I don't know, 50 yards down the road. I mean, I just, 
I was out, I was checked out, I was gone. And I was, and that's probably what made me realize, you know, all this stuff had to stop. So what I did was, you know, I, I started trying to live the life that I thought I was always going to live anyway. Everyone had said, oh, the reason you're having such a hard time is because you ask all these crazy questions and you always want to do things differently. Why don't you just try being like everybody else and life would be so much easier. So I was like, okay, well, let's see if there's something to this. I'll be like everybody else and I'll see if life gets easier. So I finished college and then, and then 9-11 happened. And I had been involved in public safety. I was a paramedic and a volunteer firefighter, rescue technician, really into it. And I thought, you know, how can I, after seeing everything that unfolded in 9-11, how can I, how could I contribute in a better way? And I thought, you know what, writing legislation is probably the place to start. And so I went to law school for that. Then of course, life takes over and you end up somewhere else completely different. But um, I, I, you know, I got a job. I bought a house, I got married and uh, was just trying to live every day the way that I thought you were supposed to do, functioning like an adult. Uh, I just wasn't really getting very much out of my life other than, you know, being able to pay the bills. At what point <clears throat> did you start to develop these tools to really create happiness? Well, it took a while, you know, I was pretty shell shocked for a while. So I was thinking I was just kind of riding it out and, and truthfully getting through law school took about all I had left uh, upstairs for a while. And then, you know, I, I knew I wasn't happy, but I knew that I wasn't suicidal either. So I figured it was probably about as good as it was going to get. And um, I did not want to become a mother. I did not want to have children because I didn't want them to live in this world as I saw it, which was not very pleasant to me. Um, and I'm not sure what changed for me, but at one point, I guess I realized if I didn't do it, then I would, that I might regret it. And so I came around to the idea and eventually I had my, my daughter and it was the, the best thing ever because I, I really enjoyed being a mom. And uh, I remember I was, stirring a pot on the stove. I'm making dinner one night and she's sitting on the floor. She wasn't even a year old. And she had a little play bowl and spoon she was playing with. And at one point she looks up at me and she's got these big brown eyes staring at me. And she picked up the bowl and spoon and she started mimicking me. She wanted to show me, look, I can stir just like mommy. It was, she's my first child, like my only child. And I had never seen anything like that before. I thought it was really cool. And then I don't know, something hit me. I, I mean, I just felt it take over my body. I had this wave of nausea hit me. I felt like I was going to faint on top of her. I had to sit down like right next to her because I realized she was copying me. She was doing everything just like mommy. And that made me realize she was learning how to live a very unfulfilled, a very lonely and depressed life, just like mommy was doing. And so right then and there on that floor, not even able to get up, I made the decision. I was going to learn how to be happy. I didn't care what it took, what I had to do, what I had to sacrifice, because I was going to teach my daughter how to be happy. I didn't think I could be happy. I did not think I was wired for it. I thought I was a lost cause, but I was not going to let her grow up suffering the way that I had. And that decision led me to start to seek out people who I thought had answers to questions about life and about happiness. And I just started studying it because I was just, you know, obsessed with this idea of, I have to help my daughter. And of course, when I started learning all this stuff, it changed my life very rapidly as well. Who were some of your biggest influences when, when you set out on this journey? Well, I started with philosophy. Um, I, I was raised Roman Catholic and I felt that I had some connection with God. Um, but I had some issues with the way the Catholic church kind of did things. And I knew I didn't want to go there to start. So I started reading a lot of philosophy um, and, you know, like traditional stuff, sort of like Descartes, Camus. Um, and I, I wrote Heidinger and that led me to people you know, you get into Google and you start searching and looking around a little bit. And that kind of led me to people who sort of took their ideas and made them a little bit more palatable for today. One of the first people who I started reading and listening to was a, a man by the name of Bob Proctor, who just passed away this past February. And he um, was probably the first one that made me take a look at 
my perspective and the way that I was viewing my day to day and my world and myself. And he shined the first mirror in my face, I think, and made me realize that I spent a lot of time feeling sorry for myself that, yeah, I had all this trauma and all of this sadness for so long, but I was, I had almost identified with it. I was attached to this idea of being that kind of a person and that, and he, he showed me that I needed to switch that mindset in order to, you know, be a happy person. I had to think like a happy person and I had to feel like a happy person and I had to behave like a happy person. And when you're not used to behaving that way, it takes a little bit of effort to, to change those habits. Right. So, uh, he's the first one that really kind of made me look, but I, I also really enjoyed, um, Thich Nhat Hanh. I read a lot of his and studied him for a long period of time. And I just kind of started grabbing spiritual gurus. I mean, I could sit here and rattle off a list of names. They're not anybody that you're going to know, but they're teachers that showed up for me in the moment that helped me with energy work and prayer and meditation and all of that great stuff that, you know, I, I then took all of these tools that I've learned from all these other places and started putting them into more of a systematic approach for myself. And then that's where my book came from. When did you start writing your book? When did you finish it? Um, how long has it been out on shelves? Uh, yeah, my book's been out for a little while now. I, I always wanted to write a book. I didn't think I could. And um, I remember talking to Bob Proctor about it. And he said, if you write the book and you finish it in two months, I'll write the foreword to it. And I said, well, I'm not going to pass up that offer. So I sat my butt down and I cranked that thing out. And, and sure enough, he wrote it for me, which was very kind of him to do. Um, so it did not take me long to write because I had already done the prep work in real life. Um, so it was just kind of taking that and codifying it into words on a page. Uh, so, yeah, it's been out for a few years. I've written a few books after that. Um, but basically... You know, I think what the book did for me more than anything was help me see how far I had really come and how simple these things can be. But it also hit home for me that it was a lot of work and it was uncomfortable work a lot of the time, right? Because it's not an easy thing to do to look at yourself and say, oh, you're not such a great human when it comes to this, or maybe you're not as smart as you thought you were when it came to this kind of a thing, right? And I think that's that has been the key to my learning and all of this is constantly going back to myself and saying, you know what, you could probably do a little bit better here. You've done a great job, like you've come a long way. And I know you like to talk about giving yourself grace too, right? But I think it's also about you know, being honest with yourself about what you're allowing to happen and what you're accepting and what you're resisting and what you are maybe not doing as great of a job at because there's some sort of fear behind it. Before we go too much further, can you tell me the titles to your books? Yes. Uh, my first book is called Get in a Good Mood and Stay There. And that was just about my journey of the things that I did to switch from being this miserable human being that no one wanted to be around, including myself most of the time, to, um, you know, probably being the happiest person that I knew uh, from there. Uh, I did a children's book series with my brother that we wrote about all the lessons that we had learned growing up with our horses and our other animals. And that was a lot of fun. It was more about passing that you know, my father died when I was young and my daughter obviously never got to meet him and she never really got to see our property or anything like that. And so I really kind of wanted to preserve some of that for, for her. Um, and, and we use that as a, a teaching tool for kids too. So, you know, introduction to courage and attitude and all of these things that play into being a happy adult. Uh, I wrote, uh, I co-authored a book with MMA gold medal champion, Janae Noonan, and we did kind of a happiness hacks kind of book where, you know, what, if I need something quick, what can I do on the fly? I'm not, I'm not feeling good. I'm sad. I'm depressed, or I'm just in a funk. What can I do to shift that energy fast? And then um, I just did a best-selling cookbook about food related to happiness that came out uh, right before the holidays. If I wanted to get all of your books, I could go to your website, right? 
yes, you can go to my website uh, or you can find everything on Amazon under my name. The cookbook is called It's All Gravy and the book with Janae is called Stripping Down Happy. Um, and the kids books are the first, it's a series of four books where the story continues on. The first book is called, <laughs> pardon me, um, Where is Opie? And it's just a story about animal friends looking for their lost goat. <laughs> Can you walk us through your your formula for happiness? Well, I can certainly walk you through part of it. Um, I think you have to start with what you want and get really clear about that and be really honest with yourself about it because we uh, hide from that a lot. We let other people's influence and thoughts and expectations of us dictate who we think we should be uh, or how we should act or what we should be doing with our lives, right? Uh, happiness in the beginning is typically a very isolating journey because there are going to be a lot of people who don't agree with you changing your life to that extent because it forces them to change and they don't want to do that. Or it makes them uncomfortable thinking, you know, you're going to leave their life or, you know, you're going to have something that they aren't going to have. People become very jealous very quickly, especially when you're walking around smiling all the time. Right. So you have to get clear with what you want, because you're going to need that to pull you through the discomfort of the change. When it gets hard, when you're feeling uncomfortable, when you don't want to look yourself in the eye and admit things to yourself, when people are dropping out of your life, when things are changing and they don't necessarily look like it's a good change right from the start, you're going to need that to propel you through those times. So that's where I like to have people start, you know, what, what is it? And it may take you a while to admit that to yourself. I know a lot of people, you know, sort of have to come back to me a few times before they finally say I'm all in because I know this is what I want and I'm not willing to compromise on it. Then from there, it kind of depends on where you are with everything, but there are some really easy things that you can do every day to help shift the energy. And once you shift the energy and allow yourself to do the work every day to shift the energy, what you'll find is the happiness, if you will, uh, takes on a momentum of its own. And it becomes so much easier to get in a good mood and stay there because you're riding that inertia. So if you do a little bit every day, you have a better chance of sustaining that feeling over time versus, you know, letting it go when you feel good and then trying to pull yourself back up when you're not feeling good because happiness isn't about, you know, skipping around and whistling all day long. Right. It's, it's really a, a, a state of peace. And when you're there, then, you know, the highs come and you enjoy the high, but then you come back down to the peace level and you're fine. And the lows come and you ride out the valley and then you come back up to normal again and you just see what it was for what it was at the time. Um, so what, so I like to say that you can do three things, right? It's called five, four, three. And the five is the five minute smile which I do every day. It's really uncomfortable for people to get started. It is a really difficult habit to keep going with because it's five full minutes, which feels like a lot of time when you're just looking at yourself in the mirror. But if you set the timer on your phone for five minutes and force yourself to smile, you start to shift the energy inside of your own body and your eyes in the mirror, see that smile coming back to you and it starts this cascade of all these great neurotransmitters and everything going on in your brain and your body and your mind and your spirit start to shift into that good vibration. Then once you're in the good vibration, I say you do four minutes of meditation, right? Now I do a lot more meditation than four minutes. I love it. So I'm there a long time, but just to get started, it's really all you need. And you can light a candle just because, you know, it, everyone's like, oh, I can't meditate. My mind's all over the place. My thoughts are all over the place. Okay, well, light a candle and focus on the flame. At least gives your mind something to do, right? And it's not about clearing your head about, you know, all the your to-do lists and everything else because thoughts are going to come in. That's no big deal. It's just about finding that connection with yourself again. Because look, all day long, you're walking around, there's chatter in your head, people's voices, your voice, some of it doesn't belong to you. Some of it does. 
how do you know what voice is the truth? How do you know what voice you're supposed to be listening to? Well, I can tell you this. If you're angry all the time, you're listening to the wrong voice. If you're anxious and you're stressed out, you're listening to the wrong voice. So to get back to that one true voice that I believe comes from our heart, you've got to sort of get rid of all of the distraction. And meditation is how I do that. And I just pretend like I'm breathing in and out through my heart and I let my heart speak to me. And I tell you that voice, once you find it, it is never wrong. And it will tell you exactly what you need to do each and every day to be happy, to be filled with purpose and meaning, and to really live the life that you were meant to live when you decided you were going to come here as I see it. And then I say number three, your three minutes is three minutes of what I call mirror work, which is just about shifting your mindset about yourself. So I pick something that I need to work on and I, I come up with an affirmation to help change that mindset about myself. So if I, you know, if I thought if I had it like a body image issue, maybe I would say, you know, Danny, you're such a beautiful woman and, and say all the nice things that I wanted to say about myself. And I would look into my right eye and I would say that repeatedly to myself, looking at my right eye for, for 90 seconds. And then I would switch to the left eye and I would do it for, for 90 seconds in there. And then I would get on with my day. And um, those three things will help you energetically be able to sustain a lot throughout the day. And at the same time, help you start to shift the way you think about things, which will change your behavior, which will then change everything around you. And, and it will happen very rapidly, but you've got to be consistent. Five minutes of smiling at yourself in the mirror, four minutes of meditation and three, three, three minutes of mirror work. Yeah. Okay. So one and a half in each eye. Yeah. It sounds really, it sounds overly simple I think at times just looking at your face while you're saying that right it sounds really simple and it sounds even kind of silly the meditation part maybe not but the smiling at yourself is kind of weird well but, no there's yeah. there's science behind it yeah there is there is definitely science behind it but even if there wasn't I know it works yeah. so what do you have to lose by trying right and it's it's three things that I know that I've done independently of one another just well, not the, you know, right eye, left eye. I okay. didn't know that was a thing. Um, makes sense. It's a but... thing now. <laughs> <laughs> now it's a thing. <laughs> but uh, the the smiling in the mirror, I don't know that I ever timed myself, but I, I've known about that. I don't know where I heard it or who gave me that direction but I've, I've known about that and I've known about just the smiling to, to kind of shift your energy from, you know, a dark place to a more positive one. Um, well, I'll tell you what too, it really attracts people into your life as well, because when I started doing it, I, I was, I had, was not buying into it, but I had been told, even if you fake your way through it for a while, you can do it. And, and, but I had been told, you know, just do it for a little while. And I said, you know what, this little while isn't working. I'm going to commit to five minutes, right. And see what happens. And then sort of magically within a couple of weeks, you know, people were just randomly saying hi to me and Hey, how's it going? And I mean, just strangers coming up to me and talking to me randomly at places. Um, and I, I realized how probably closed off I had really been, but by doing that, how much my energy had shifted to the point where people were picking up on it. So, so it's not even just helpful for yourself as far as shifting everything. It just, it starts to bring all this good energy towards you. And then that's where the momentum starts to build. And when you see that external stuff shifting, that's really what helps you keep the faith to keep going. I really, really wanted to have this conversation with you because, you know, a lot of times, well, not a lot of times because I've had quite a few guests on here where the focus of the conversation is on mental health and, you know, really how to overcome some of the symptoms of PTSD and different modalities and all that stuff. And there are, you know, there's a big part of my audience that they're veterans and first responders with PTSD. Yeah. And what you're talking about, I'm sure that they're familiar. If, if not now, eventually they're going to 
come in contact with a mental health professional that gives them one or two of the tools in some form, but that what you're offering with those three things, the 543 is a simple way to help somebody shift from that really dark place where they just want to stay in bed all day and cover their head with a pillow, um, self-medicate all that. You know, there's, there's these three simple things that we can do to, I don't know, bring a, a little bit of life back into us, you know? And, and I just, I really appreciate you sharing that with me. And, um, and there is more to your book than just that. Um, I, I was wondering if, well, maybe out of all the books that you've written, is there a, a couple of, a couple more pieces of wisdom that you could share with us that, that could help us? Sure. Um, I'll talk you, about this all day long. All right. Well, <laughs> the, the professional fighter you were talking about, um, that book where it's hacks on how to shift your energy. Um, are they similar to the five, four, three? They're a little bit different. We tried to keep it a little bit more practical. Uh, you know, speaking to some of the people in your audience, you, you know, I was around public safety for a long time and there are a lot of veterans in that area. So I did see considerable PTSD and other issues too. What I will tell you is that at my darkest moment, when I was you know, I was pretty sure that I wasn't going to be here much longer. Um, one thing that I, I did, and I think you really have to start small, right? And, and I don't think that smiling is probably the place to go because it's probably the last thing that you want to do. But I, for, I forced myself, no matter how bad it was, to go outside for 15 minutes a day. That's, I mean, and that took everything that I had in me. Um, cause I did not want to get out of bed. I was not sleeping. And so my, my sleep was, you know, erratic and I was abusing drugs and alcohol. And I, I, you know, I really didn't know what to do with myself, but I forced myself no matter the weather. And I don't live in the best weather situation <laughs> to go outside for 15 minutes every day. And I would just, and, and honestly, I, I just crossed off the days on the calendar for as long as I could. And I just held to that one habit and just said, if I'm going to make it to tomorrow and I'm going to go outside and I'm going to make it to tomorrow and I'm going to go outside. And I, after a while, I started to see all these X's on this calendar. And I realized if I could do that, then I could probably do a little bit more. And so I would start to incorporate a couple other things here and there as well. Right. And this is just kind of what got me through that period of time I was talking about in my teenage years. Um, but it worked. And, and here's the thing. I know how lucky I am because there were a lot of people who never made it out of that mental institution. And there were a lot of people who got out and then did not live much longer after that. Um, happiness is a discipline, I think more than anything else. And, and it goes back to what I was saying. It's not about flying high, you know, skipping around, whistling all day long. It's, it's about finding that level of peace and if you can find that spiritual component of it, where you feel connected in your heart, right? Even if you're alone in the world, you know that somehow you are important. Somehow you are connected to everything else here. When you really are able to feel that, not think it, but feel that, it shifts everything in your life. And I believe that the people who are suffering the most have the most ability to tap into that feeling. So if you will allow it to happen for yourself, then you know, no matter what, you're going to be okay. And you realize how important you really are. You'll look at it from a physics standpoint, right? You are so important that if you were to cease to exist, the entire model of the world of the universe would collapse in on itself, right? Because every piece is that important. And I figure if you're that important to the universe, then the universe probably wants to support you as much as, as it can, right? And you can use the term universe, God, source, whatever, 
whatever term you're comfortable with, right? I use God all the time, but but it, you are being supported. And if you can just hold on to the fact that there is something there, even if you can't see it and have that faith long enough in the universe to let it work its magic, you will start to see things shift and it's going to take time and it's going to take patience and it's going to take discipline, but it will get better. And that is what I held on to. All right. By my fingernails hanging from the ledge, but I did it. And I know if I can do it, cause I had zero support that you can do it as well. And then go on and take these other pieces that I give you. And that all these other people out there give you to help you grow what works for you, right? Pick and choose. You don't have to do it all. Find what really works for you. Keep what you like, get rid of the rest of it and just enjoy the moment. I like that you use that word discipline. Uh, <clears throat> and earlier you mentioned Thich Nhat Hanh, um, one of one of the most well known monks, uh, Buddhist monks. Um, pretty incredible person. Yeah, I, I'd say so. <laughs> Like, I, I don't, I knew of him. I didn't know his name. It wasn't until I interviewed Roger Sparks on, on here where he uh, quoted Bruce Lee in uh, Enter the Dragon. Okay. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, don't look at my finger. Uh, the okay. finger's yeah. pointing right. away to the moon. Yeah. yeah. You know, and and it's and that was actually from Thich Nhat Hanh's book, like what was the name of that? Uh, White clouds, something. Do you know what book I'm talking about? I think so. Yeah, I know he has a few. I, Pieces the way is mostly what I've read, but uh, I listened to him a lot. And you know what I liked about him is he told this story when he first went to the monastery. He said he was walking around one day and one of his masters was sitting in the main room uh, where they ate their meals. And he had to go through that room to get into the kitchen because he wanted to get a drink of water. And so he was, you know, he's like, I'm very respectful and being very quiet. And I walk from the one side through this room, you know, not to, so I don't disturb my master. And I go into the kitchen to get a glass of water and I come back out and my master goes, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I just, I didn't mean to disturb you. Just want to drink a water. And the master said, you do everything from this point forward with purpose. Everything you do has purpose. You take each step with purpose. You walk across this room with purpose. You open that door with purpose. You get your water with purpose. You close the door with purpose. Everything you do with purpose from this point forward. And then he used that to say how that correlated into how he started living his life, how he would go outside and he would look at the sky with purpose. He would take a step with purpose. He would breathe air with purpose. Now that's a tremendous amount of discipline, which, you know, he was obviously a very inspiring individual and capable of maintaining that kind of consciousness all of the time. I'm not saying you're going to be able to do that. But if you can come back to that from time to time throughout the day, it will change your life. If you can pay attention to the fact that you're breathing air, that you are life right here, right now, then you will start to have joy in the silliest and most simple of moments that you, you won't even be able to explain to somebody else because you can't explain it there. It's beyond words. Um, you can have a magical experience just going outside in the morning and taking a fresh you know, breath of air or drinking a cup of coffee um, or washing your face even. And when, you, when you're able to connect that deeply in the moment with, with your life, uh, you realize how rich it is just right here, right now. And you have this tremendous sense of gratitude. When you're filled up with gratitude and love, it's really hard not to be happy. And you don't go seeking it in external things because you realize everything you need is right here. So I have the hard cover of that book. Um, it's Old Path, White Clouds. Okay, that makes, yeah, yeah, that rings a bell. And what it is, is it's the most complete uh, recounting 
of the Buddha's life from childhood until he leaves earth. And it's all these stories of his interactions with the different monks and um, his teachings and conversations. And it's, it's just really, really interesting. And it was all taken from translations of, uh, what are they called? Sutras. Okay. So, and it was compiled by Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, anyways, I, I had to get the book after, you know, I did a little bit of research after uh, Roger Sparks was like, yeah. uh, you know, if you, if you only focus on the finger, you'll miss all that heavenly glory, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and what it was, it was a lesson that the Buddha was teaching one of his monks about, you know, he, the point of practicing Buddhism, practicing meditation, practicing, you know, this mindfulness and, and focusing on the, uh, the here and now, you know, doing things with purpose, the point of all that, you know, brings you to a beautiful place in your life or within yourself, that inner beauty to be able to experience that. And if you're paying attention to what somebody is pointing at, if you're paying attention to that finger, you're going to miss the point of all of it. So that yeah. is, that was uh, in that lesson. And that's in that book, um, Old Path, White Clouds. Now, real quick, just because I, I thought this was really, really cool. Um, did you know that Thich Nhat Hanh uh, was, you know, received the uh, Nobel Peace Prize? Yes. Do you know who nominated him for it? I do not know who nominated him. Martin Luther King Jr. Well, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, I was like, when I read that, I was like, man, this is crazy. <laughs> yeah i mean he i i think Thich Nhat Hanh is probably one of those human beings who pretty much transcended the human experience there there have been a few on earth over the period of time i think he probably did it um i didn't hear this story from him but just kind of going back to your point before and i think this this is probably something that helps a lot of people with depression and ptsd too is i heard this story and it's it's a fable it's a or i guess a fable it's a uh a folklore story, right? So there, there are these monks in Nepal and um, that, you know, the, the monk in charge of the monastery says, okay, today we're going to go out on our walk and we're going to be in complete silence until we get back. There'll be no talking. And then we can talk about all the things that you've, you've thought about and you've, and you've learned and blah, 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 blah. So they're on their walk and they're following along and um, they come to a, the, a river and there's a woman standing next to the river. And so the, the monk in charge goes up to the woman and starts talking to her and all the other monks are just kind of like glancing at one another. Cause you know, you're not really supposed to be talking to women and, and we're supposed to be silent, but okay. So he, he, there's obviously an issue with the woman. And the next thing, you know, the head monk picks the woman up and he carries her across the river and puts her down on the other side. Now these monks are going crazy, but they're going crazy inside because they're not allowed to talk. And oh my God, he touched a woman. He picked her, he physically held her. He picked her up and took her across this river. So the rest of them follow across the river and, you know, they all bow to her and then they walk along and they finish their walk and they come home. And, and the monk says, okay, our, our silence period is over. You know, what, what did you observe from today? What did you get out of the day? And all their hands go up and they're like, oh my God, master, you touched a woman. We're not allowed to do that. And blah, 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 blah. And the master says, yes, yes, you have to understand. He said, that was something that was, was that we weren't supposed to do. That was unexpected. That came out of life. He said, however, I put that woman down on the other side of the river and you continue to carry her with you throughout the day. So just the idea of being able to accept something for what it is in the moment and deal with it and then put it down and be able to go on to the next thought or the next feeling or the next moment or the next thing that you need to deal with in life having that ability is huge um, because those thoughts will cycle on you and they will really make it hard for you to kind of get out of your own way. Um, if you can drop below the thought 
and into your heart and feel the situation rather than think through the situation, you will save yourself a lot of anxiety and frustration. Most of us are carrying around a lot of extra weight that we do not need to shoulder every day, right? And and you can take it even, even simpler as you can just focus on that first sphere you were talking about. Because if if you are just worried about what you can control, which is yourself, and you're in that modality of discipline with regard to that, then you're going to influence for the good and you're going to influence the right energy and the right energy is going to come back to you, right? I mean, how much influence do we really have? Even if you think about it, I tell people, well, I I probably have some influence over my dog, maybe, <laughs> maybe a little bit, right? Other than that, I don't really feel like I have a whole lot of influence where I have power to create in my life and to make things happen is through me and that's it. And I don't um, attach it to anything else. And when things are going good, I know that I must be doing the right work. And when things are not going good, then I know that I need to shift something, right? It, It starts and stops with me every single day. And when you take on that accountability and that personal responsibility, you you know, it's, it's hard thing to do at first, but once you do it, you realize how much more power you really have, but it's only with respect to yourself. And so that's the only thing you really need to focus on, which is really nice. How old is your daughter now? She is almost seven. Nice. Yeah. And she's the first one to point out any disparity in my actions or my speech (laughs) with respect to any of this. So I know she's listening. Uh, if I say anything that is just slightly, you know, you have your moments and trust me, I have them. I'm human. I accept that. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. If I fall into something and I start, you know, complaining or doing something, she's the first person to say, Hey mom, you don't, you say this, (laughs) right. (laughs) In fact, my brother told me the other day, they went for a walk and he said something of, I don't know, he brought my name up somehow. And she, and she said, yeah, she's like, mom isn't really grouchy. And for someone who wrote the book, get in a good mood and stay there. I just don't understand. And he said, my brother was dying, he, but she, <laughs> she, kids are so smart. And, and most of the reason why is because they, they are in the present moment. They don't allow all of that crazy distraction to come in, right? They're just themselves. They love themselves for who they are. And they are always present in the moment. That's why they're so happy. And then we come in and we destroy that for them. But if you want to see how to be happy, just watch children. They'll tell you how to do it without really a whole lot of work. Before your daughter goes away and starts building her own life, What is one important lesson that you want to impart upon her? I really want her to be able to trust her own heart. In the dedication to my book, I wrote, follow your heart, baby girl, and the rest will follow you. I think we're so easily distracted and persuaded by outside influence and that turns into self-doubt and lack of confidence in so many areas. And we, we talk ourselves out of so many things that we want to do and what we want to be and what we want to accomplish and how we want to live our lives. I really would love for her to, to really own that voice, to learn the meditation and the techniques that I, that I use to get to my heart's voice and to not be afraid to follow that. Even when it seems like you're going the wrong way, right? From as far as outside results coming back to you are concerned to just be able to hold that faith in herself and to follow it no matter what, because ultimately I want her to be happy. I want her to live a happy life. And I, what that looks like for her, I have no idea. Um, but I would hate to see her veer off the path because of somebody else's opinion or because she's following someone else down another path or because she doesn't believe she can do something. Um, I want her to be true to herself. You know what? I completely derailed the one question that I asked uh, about the, uh, the hacks for shifting your energy. You want to go back to that? Yeah. Like, <laughs> okay. I, I want to know a couple of them. <laughs> Um, I like playlists, uh, music that is inspiring to you or that is upbeat. There's, if you go and you Google, you can actually find scientific research that's been done on some songs based on the rhythm and the cadence. They're actually 
scientifically proven to help uplift the mood. But if you need a really quick shift um, to get your head out of your butt and get moving, the playlist is the place to go. So have one that you list as your good mood playlist and don't put any songs on there that evoke any other emotion other than you know, happiness. And you could have one that's like super happy, like upbeat happy. And you could have one that's sort of more like peaceful, happy. That's fine too. But don't put anything in there that triggers anything negative whatsoever. I don't, you know, a a memory or a feeling or anything like that. And just have that as your go-to place where you need to go when you need it. You can just hit play and get on with your day. Um, I'm a big fan of journaling, of uh, being able to get stuff out side of you to look at it from a different perspective, put it down on a piece of paper and make it into a thing instead of part of you. And then you're able to look at it completely differently, more objectively. You can even, you know, sit there and look at it, say, you know, how would, how would my mentor Clint Arthur look at this? Right. Or how would my daughter look at this? Or how would someone else I admire look at this particular thing? And, um, and then it, it, it no longer has control over you. you. It's no longer part of you in any way. It's just this thing that you kind of have to deal with. Um, so I like journaling. It also helps with the whole, what do you want kind of thing. And going back to that, a lot of times I have people sort of write out the story of their life and how they want it to look and who they want to be. Because I think we forget that we're the main character in our story. So if you're feeling sort of lost in the whole meaning purpose game and a little, you know, distracted from what you think you're supposed to be doing here, but not necessarily sure how to get back on track with that. I would suggest sitting down and writing out what, you know, what you would want your life to look like, but more importantly, what you want it to feel like, right? What do you want each day to feel like? Who is around you? What is important? What do you need to do to feel good? What kinds of things do you want to have around you? Where do you want to live? Um, How do you want to live? What kind of person do you want to be? And if you take out time and money and obstacles, you take out all barriers, right? There's nothing stopping you. What would it look like? And that will give you a really good sense of the kind of person you are. And that will help you stay truer to, again, that voice inside of your heart that's trying to get you back on track, but you just don't want to listen to it. Yeah. And and I just want to comment on one thing earlier when I brought up PTSD how your comment about how that that smiling might not be for the person that's really really struggling how true that is and it's something and shame on me I mean I've been there and I didn't even consider that point not but, shame on you i remember well, how many people said hang in there just hang in there well this is the last thing i wanted to hear right like i'm seriously you have no idea i'm it's taking everything i have within me every single day to hang in there right so it's just why don't you smile right and you know as a woman you kind of hear that a lot too from men they just smile more smile and it's like oh you know all you want to do is put up both middle fingers when somebody mm, says that to get you. out of my face <laughs> right <laughs> I'll just show you a smile. So yeah, it, it just might not be, um, I don't, I don't want to smile. I have, I have no reason to smile. I don't feel like smiling. I don't want to smile. So why would smiling make me feel any better? You have to find something that, you know, is, is really simple. I mean, if it's, if it's seriously, if it's just washing your hair or, or brushing your teeth, even, I mean, start where you have to start because I mean, you're just too important not to. I look back at those really dark days that I, I went through and I, I try not to reflect on them. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's doesn't make me happy. (laughs) Right. But I do recall forcing myself to get out of bed and go out either just out to the couch where the blinds were open and there was Mm -hmm. sunlight coming in, you know, just that step was a win for me. And then to be able to go outside and feel the sun on me. Yeah. That, 
Yeah, those, you're absolutely right. Those little wins, you know, if, if you can just take little steps one at a time, I mean, that's how you have to do it. Yeah. And it's not super encouraging to hear that, right? Like you said, <laughs> when you reflect back and you know where you were, and I mean, it, if you've not been there, then it's kind of hard to imagine, but when you're, when you're there, and, and you know how easy ending it is and how quickly you could do it and how you wouldn't have to put yourself through this every day. I mean, it takes a lot to do some of those things. So you have to be invested in the little win. Um, I think it shows tremendous courage. I think there are a lot of people who show tremendous courage every day just by getting up and getting into the shower. And we don't acknowledge that. Um, so yeah, for me to sit here and say, yeah, smile for five minutes. Yeah, that's great. But honestly, if you can get out of bed and you can do something for yourself, then I consider that you have won the day and that you deserve to be congratulated and that you should be happy for yourself in that regard. And then when you feel like you've mastered that particular task, maybe try another one. And if you miss a day, okay, don't worry about it. Just try again tomorrow right? We're not keeping score here, even though it looks like that, especially with social media and everything else, right? Everything, everybody wants to keep score and um, how I'm measuring up compared to everyone else. Well, that's not it. Your lessons are your lessons. And so you take as much time as you need to, to learn them. I am so thankful that, well, one, that I met Clint Arthur <laughs> and got invited to Philadelphia. He's going to love this episode, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's where I met you right. and, and got to hear you speak. And just being able to share this message with, with my audience, I, I feel so, I'm just really grateful. So thank you very much, Danny. And um, for those listening, uh, I, I will have a link to Danny's website and you can go there, find her books, find what she's doing now and follow her on social media. You, I mean, you got a pretty good TikTok following now, huh? It's getting there. Yeah. Thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there anything that uh, any piece of wisdom or something that we didn't touch on that you'd like to leave the audience with? I just want to say, I appreciate you and all that you're doing and all of the people out there who are listening to you, because uh, you don't even realize just by sitting here and listening to these kinds of messages and then going out and telling other people about it, how much you may be helping. You know, I talked before about how connected we all are. And I really believe that. And um, I think if you can continue to hold that in your heart, that you'll make a huge difference in the world. And so I appreciate everyone who puts in effort every day just to be a good human being and try to help someone else. Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on your favorite podcast platform and visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. My goal is and always will be to add value to as many people as possible. So if I can be of any assistance to you or someone you know, please connect with me via email or on one of my social media accounts linked on the homepage of my website. Remember, our failures don't define us unless we let them. And the only true measure of a leader is the success of their team.